Back in the temporal world, it is day four of the Democratic National Convention. It is time to consider what we have learned so far. We've seen an awful lot this week. We watched Elizabeth Warren promise to bring peace to Indian country. We saw a lady call in from her $11 million summer home in Martha's Vineyard and claim to be oppressed. We met a gender transcendent mermaid queen king who dreamt of a world without police or prisons. We saw a post-makeover Sandy Cortez nominate a man she referred to mysteriously as Bernard Sanders for president. We've seen a lot this week. What does it all mean? Well, one thing it definitely does not amount to is a coherent ideological framework or a logical governing strategy. John Kasich and Sandy Cortez may both have decided to vote for Joe Biden, but that's about the only thing they agree on. Joe Biden himself doesn't have particularly strong views on anything these days, except maybe lunch and a nap. And no one in the room likes Kamala Harris. So what exactly do all of these people have in common? They are all unhappy, deeply and personally unhappy, tormented at the most basic level. This is the coalition of the miserable. It's hard to know precisely what went wrong for these people. Some of them are mad at their fathers. For others, life didn't turn out in the way they'd hoped. Dash dreams, the usual story, it can make people bitter. Many others are simply victims of their own affluence. Being rich for too long tends to destroy people from within, particularly when they didn't earn it. They become guilty and restless and insecure. Whatever the cause, you could not pick a more maladjusted group than the speakers of the DNC this week. You wouldn't want these people babysitting your kids. Last night, fittingly, the schedule included an appearance by a singer called Billie Eilish. Eilish is a very talented performer. She's also very young, so we don't want to be cruel here. But the first thing you notice about Billie Eilish is that she's very unhappy. She works in the music business. Maybe it's not surprising. But whatever she's got going on in her personal life, you don't want to be part of it. And who knows what it's really about? She probably doesn't know. Most of us don't really understand what ails us. But for the purposes of last night's event, it doesn't matter. Like almost everybody in the Democratic Party, Billie Eilish has decided that Donald Trump is her core problem. You don't need me to tell you things are a mess. Donald Trump is destroying our country and everything we care about. We need leaders who will solve problems like climate change and COVID, not deny them. Leaders who will fight against systemic racism and inequality. It starts with voting against Donald Trump and for Joe Biden. We all have to vote like our lives and the world depend on it because they do. Donald Trump is destroying everything we care about, period. That right there is the message of the DNC this week. The message is not Joe Biden can identify his own wife by sight and is therefore fit to lead the country. No, it's not Kamala Harris is actually a very sincere person who's really thought through the issues that matter. No, it's not even vote for us and our program will make the country better. No, it's not. In fact, it's simpler than that and therefore maybe more compelling. It's you're unhappy. So are we. It's all Donald Trump's fault. Let's kick him out. And honestly, you can kind of see the appeal here. Real life, by contrast, is complicated. It's never that obvious why things go wrong. And of course, if we're being honest about it, all of us are implicated in our own failures to a much greater extent than we care to admit. But that's the thing. At the Democratic National Convention, you don't have to admit it. You did nothing wrong. You're blameless. It's all Donald Trump's fault. Watch Chief Warren live from Indian country. Donald Trump's ignorance and incompetence have always been a danger to our country. COVID-19 was Trump's biggest test. He failed miserably. This crisis is on Donald Trump and the Republicans who enable him. On November 3rd, we will hold them all accountable. See, add the coronavirus to the list of his crimes. It's all there. When he wasn't stuffing your neighborhood's mailboxes into the back of his Suburban, it turns out Donald Trump was up late in his basement lab mixing up lethal bat pathogens, which he then mercilessly unleashed on America from his own personal wet market. You should see what he did to the nursing homes in the state of New York. It's awful. But if nothing else, give that man points for energy. Donald Trump is so committed to making you unhappy that he rarely sleeps. Okay, you look skeptical. How could one man achieve so much global evil in a single 24-hour day? There's just isn't time. When did he have a chance to call Vladimir Putin? And that's a fair point. It does sound unlikely. 
On the other hand, it's easier than the alternative explanations. Let's say you lost a presidential election that by any measure you should have won. Your husband was the president, you were up in the polls, but in the end it turned out that you were too entitled. You were too out of touch. Voters just didn't like you. It would be hard to admit that to yourself. It would be even harder to admit it to others. You might just prefer to blame Donald Trump. He must have cheated. It sounds like something he would do. I wish Donald Trump knew how to be a president because America needs a president right now. Remember back in 2016 when Trump asked, what do you have to lose? Well, now we know. Our health care, our jobs, our loved ones, our leadership in the world, and even our post office. Don't forget, Joe and Kamala can win by three million votes and still lose. Take it from me. So we need numbers overwhelming. So Trump can't sneak or steal his way to victory. See, Trump stole it, along with the mailboxes and the payphones. Of course he did. Donald Trump is such a bad person that the true scope of his diabolical awfulness is hard to describe. Maybe impossible to describe, like the concept of infinity. And in fact, maybe it's better not even to try to describe it. It's like when your grandmother got sick. No one wanted to say exactly what it was. The disease was too scary. Trump is that bad. The good news is, compared to Donald Trump, everybody else looks good, even the worst people, maybe especially the worst people. And that's the beauty of it. Listen to how they're describing Teddy Kennedy at the DNC. I've admired Joe Biden since I was a Senate intern in 1974. He shared my Uncle Teddy's commitment to civil rights, women's rights, and working families. Uncle Teddy's commitment to women's rights, yes. The same Uncle Teddy who fled the scene of a drunk driving accident and left a young woman to drown slowly in the back seat. The same Uncle Teddy who for decades chaired the Harvey Weinstein School of Dating. Compared to Donald Trump, though, Uncle Teddy was a champion of women. That's their position. And you're starting to see the appeal of the message, are you not? Everyone gets off the hook except for Donald Trump. And of course, people who look like Donald Trump, they're evil too. It's guilt by resemblance. Watch CNN explain. It was all about representation. My little melanated, cynical heart, my immigrant melanated woman heart felt so full last night. Actually, today is today with David and John is the first time I see a white man like in <laughs> eight hours. This, you know, other than than Joe Biden last night, and that's okay. They've had 240 years of representation. They're going to be okay. So this is how bad he is. Anyone with the same skin color as Donald Trump is repulsive. In fact, so disgusting, so repugnant to gaze upon that even a brief respite from looking at people like this feels like a vacation. The CNN anchor is now refreshed, as she just told you. It was like a spa treatment in Sedona. Fetch the hot towels. Give me the cucumbers for my eyes. Keep in mind, nothing you just heard is racism. <laughs> no. Now, of course, if you said that about the CNN anchor, obviously it would be racism. You would be fired for it, maybe arrested. But the CNN anchor isn't Donald Trump, is she? No. She's not someone who looks like Donald Trump, is she? No. Okay, so it's fine. Just like drowning a woman in a car. It totally depends. Was Trump around? It's all about context. Eventually, Kamala Harris took the stage last night and continued this theme. Whatever else we are in the Democratic Party, and actually, we're not going to tell you what we are. You don't need to know. We are definitely not Donald Trump. And that's enough. So just vote for us. Everything will be fine. So I think we need to ask ourselves, why don't they want us to vote? Why is there so much effort to silence our voices? And the answer is because when we vote, things change. When we vote, things get better. Oh, there it is right there. That's the line of the night. When we vote, things get better. Vote for us and things will get better. She's not telling you how they're going to get better. Why would she? Just vote. Put us in power and your life will instantly improve. That's the promise they're making. It's also the promise they've been making for decades. And for decades, people have believed them. Democrats now control nearly every major population center in this country. So the question is, how are those places doing? Have things gotten better in, say, Chicago or Detroit or Baltimore or Gary or Birmingham or name the city? 
We're not going to answer that. We're going to leave the reporting on that to you. Just Google the name of any major American city and see how life is looking for the people who live in those places right now. They did what they were told. They voted the way Kamala Harris wanted them to vote. Did life improve? That is a fair question. It's the basic question. It may be the only question that matters. Democrats hate it when you ask. When you press them, they'll let you know that, and this may come as a shock, Donald Trump is destroying things in places they've controlled for generations. Bill de Blasio just said that the other day. And then they change the subject. They're on to something else. Often they bring up a place called Selma. Selma is a small city in the state of Alabama. Selma is famous because there was a consequential civil rights march there 55 years ago this spring. You hear a lot about the march. But you never hear how the story ended. People in Selma voted. And good, that was the point of the march. And they voted for Democrats. How did that turn out for them? Selma is now the poorest city in Alabama. It is the most dangerous place in the state. It has the highest unemployment rate. More than 40% of the people who live in Selma are poor. They're in poverty. That's a tragedy. It's amazing there is a city like that in this country. Does Kamala Harris care? Has she ever mentioned real life Selma as distinct from Selma the metaphor? Probably she hasn't. And more to the point, what has Kamala Harris done to make Selma better? Come on, you know the answer. Progressive Democrats took control of Selma, and that was the end of the story, because taking control was the whole point. The lives of the actual people who remained there didn't matter, and they still don't. But to Kamala Harris, this is the blueprint for the rest of the country. In the excessive use of force by police, and in our broader criminal justice system, there is no vaccine for racism. We've got to do the work for George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, for the lives of too many others to name. We've got to do the work to fulfill that promise of equal justice under law. Because here's the thing, none of us are free until all of us are free. Yeah, okay. What's interesting, though, is what Kamala Harris didn't say in that speech. At no point, and we listened carefully, did she mention any of the people dying as she was speaking? The beatings, for example, that took place, the assaults that were going on as the Democratic National Convention progressed this week, they're not important. The other day in Manhattan, a retired NYPD sergeant was viciously beaten and robbed on camera. We showed you beatings in Portland. Cities across the country are falling apart in real time. Take a look at the DNC's after party this week. Watch. I've ever seen right now. Those are real people. Their lives matter. No matter what they look like, no matter who they voted for, no matter what they believe, they're Americans, their lives matter. And they're being hurt, in some cases killed, but they weren't mentioned. They haven't been mentioned all week at the Democratic National Convention. Why is that? because the policies they're pushing are implicated in the violence you're watching. Nor have they mentioned what's happening in California right now, our biggest state, Kamala Harris's home state. They're rolling blackouts. We need a Green New Deal, the Democrats tell you. Okay, what will that look like? Well, there is one state in the union that is closer to a Green New Deal than any other. It's California. And thanks to its green energy policy, California is now suffering historic power outages in the middle of a heat wave. By the way, that can kill people. For another thing, it's not a first world situation. We're supposed to have electricity. And when our biggest state doesn't, it tells you there's been massive and profound, possibly criminal mismanagement. Who did that and why? Shouldn't we be interested in finding out? Hmm, no mention of it last night. Well, we would have been without power 60 plus hours since uh, Friday night. Inside Carl Whitley's home, at least half a dozen medical devices that need power. All of them helped to keep his son alive. During other power outages, he would get advance notice from PG&E, but not this weekend. This particular outage, we got no heads up 
We got no information. Thousands of residents in San Jose lost power over the weekend as early as Friday night. This map shows that thousands more are still affected. Look, most voters in California are Democrats. This is not in any sense a partisan point. California will vote for Kamala Harris in November. There's no question about that. It's a question of helping actual people, not just repeating mindless platitudes, telling us the same two stories about police brutality. Nobody defends police brutality. Nobody's in favor of it. But if you keep talking about the same two stories, it gives us the sense that you're intentionally ignoring what's actually happening, which is the consistent lowering of the standard of living for actual Americans, millions of them. So you shouldn't be surprised if you continue to ignore things people actually care about, that people may not be that excited about your candidacy, despite how they feel about the guy you're running against. In the case of Kamala Harris, that meant they had to make people up. Take a look at this. This is the banner behind Kamala Harris. They had to duplicate some of her fans after the address. <laughs> it was hard to find a room full of people actually clapping, so they just invented some people out of thin air. If it's good enough for Major League Baseball, it's good enough for the DNC. Take a look. So if you're wondering where the genuine supporters are, they may be wandering around looking for an actual message. Trump bad. Even if you agree with that, it's a little thin after a while.